Good morning. Come on in. It's good to see everyone out this morning. We had a good number at our first service and even a better number here on a holiday weekend, but it has been great weather. I hope that you've already enjoyed your weekend and will enjoy the Lord's Day even more so and then Labor Day tomorrow. It's a blessing to see you all. If you are listening by way of radio or watching on live stream, I actually think the live stream was just for the first service, but they may be playing it now. We're glad to have you. We're glad to see you. We would welcome you to be in attendance here in person each and every opportunity that you might have. If you are here in person and you're visiting with us, there are packets in the foyer. If you'd like to grab one of those, fill that out, give it to one of us. We can acknowledge your visit, get to know you and ask any questions that you feel you would need to ask. If you're in need of the restroom or nursery, those are provided, and you know the precautions on those. Leading us in worship this morning, our opening prayer will be by Jared Morgan. The Lord's Supper officiant will be Kendall Stevenson. Our scripture will be by Kyle Walker. Corey Westerfield will be leading us in singing, and of course, Mark Ray will deliver our lesson. It's a very good lesson. To prepare our minds for worship this morning, we'll read three verses from the Hebrew writer in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the God that we worship. And we obtain information of what he communicates to us through his son, which is the word of God. And that's why we're here this morning, to praise God, to worship him. Corey, at this time, will lead us in our first song. Let's all stand. I'm satisfied. seated. No tears.
This time we'll have our opening prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, thank you, Father. Thank you that we could be here today and to worship you and to be with our loved ones. Thank you for all the great gifts in life, especially Jesus and the hope that he provides no matter what we experience here, no matter our sorrow, no matter our difficulties. We realize, Father, that there is hope in you and it will be better. Thank you for all the great gifts in life. Thank you for our families. Thank you for our church friends. Thank you for our good neighbors. And help us, Father, to focus on worshiping this hour and serving you. Be with our leaders of the congregation. Strengthen and encourage them. Help them to make difficult decisions that they make from time to time. Be with our deacons and the work that they carry out. Be with each member as teachers and those who work in, on your behalf. Father, we ask this hour that you be with our preacher. Bless he and his family. Strengthen him. Help him to present what's been prepared. And may we walk away from here today feeling encouraged and uplifted and prepared for the week to come. Jesus, it's your name we pray this this morning. Amen. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing 375, if you want to follow along in the book. 375. Oh, the death and the riches of God's saving. The church at Corinth, <clears throat> excuse me, had made something out of the Lord's Supper that wasn't pleasing to God, and I believe that's why the Spirit, Paul was inspired by the Spirit to write what he did in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
I want to, there's a lot of issues there, and obviously we don't have time for everything this morning. I want to concentrate on three verses of that in 27, 28, and 29, starting, but starting in verse 23 through 25. <clears throat> Paul explains again what the cup meant, what the, what the bread meant. And then verse 26 is a transitional verse that I'd read a couple of weeks ago. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Then in verse 27, Therefore, because of what I just said, he says, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Church, we need to pause there and think about that verse. In fact, we would do well if we would go home and, and really delve into that and what he's saying there. I can't imagine a more serious charge being brought than being guilty <clears throat> of the body and the blood of our Lord. Verse 28, but a man must examine himself, and so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgments to himself, he does not judge the body rightly. In verses 23 through 25, we're to look outward. We're looking at the cross. Starting in verse 27 through 29, we're looking inward. We're looking at ourselves. And that's when it gets difficult. But let a man examine himself. I find it interesting that nowhere in Scripture do we have biblical authority to judge anyone but ourselves. But that's what he's saying do here. If we don't take anything away from what I say this morning, we've got to understand the seriousness of what we're doing. What we're doing has eternal consequences. Because if we, if we do not do this in a proper manner, it says that we're guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus. It's easy. The brother last week talked about distractions, and we have them. We've really had them this year, wouldn't you agree? We've had people fighting over a roll of toilet paper or a pack of chicken wings for crying out loud. So it's easy to be distracted. And I understand how difficult it is in a time like this for you young families. I've been there. When you've got a lap full of two-year-old that will not sit still, and yet you're trying to concentrate on the body and the blood of Jesus. Well, God's not going to put more on you than you can stand. Nor are we. You keep them babies in this auditorium and keep bringing them. That's okay. But to the rest of us, what are we going to be doing during the partaking of this Lord's Supper? If we take this verse seriously, it says, But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. This is a holiday weekend. What are you going to be thinking about while we're partaking of these emblems? You know, we might get around to golf in this afternoon. Going to be a pretty day, going to turn cold and rain the end of the week. Let's go to, you know, are we thinking about that? Are we sending and receiving texts during the Lord's Supper? Meddling now, ain't I? This is serious business. What we're about to do is serious business. We're discerning the Lord's body till he comes. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. If he does not judge the body rightly, that's hard for me to do. I don't know about you, but when we look at the cross, we should see a reflection of ourselves if we're doing this right. Now is the time to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. There's a lot of discussion about these verses, and I won't go any farther, but let's, let's put all these things out of our mind. And you've heard that a million times. But let's try to do that and really concentrate on what happened on Calvary for us. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning unworthy of your love and your mercy. Father, we're unworthy of the sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary's cross. 
we could just, Father, uh, appeal to your love and your grace and your mercy to forgive us of all our sins and our shortcomings that we might stand before you this morning and, and to remember the death of our Savior in a proper way. Father, we're thankful for the body, the broken body that hung on Calvary's cross. We can't imagine the love and also the anguish that you had watching that happen. Thank you for that love and thank you for that mercy. Help us to partake in a worthy manner. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the redeeming blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. We know from reading your word that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. We're so thankful that we can live in hope of eternal life because of the blood that Jesus shed. Help us to be obedient to him and to you, to live our lives as a reflection of of that great love. Again, thank you for this cup. Bless it and bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That concludes the observance of the Lord's Supper. Um, as a matter of convenience, we always, uh, we normally take a contribution. Of course, everyone knows there's receptacles in the back of the auditorium for you to make that contribution. But let's go to Father in prayer and give him thanks for what he's done for us in a material way. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. We do know and understand that all good and perfect gifts come from you both spiritual and material. Father, you've blessed us beyond measure in this country, and we're thankful for that. Help us to turn back to you, Father, that you would continue to bless us. We're thankful for the homes that we have, the jobs that we have, the food that we eat. Father, we know that you will care for those that love you and are obedient to you. Help us to do that and help us to never take anything for granted. But also, Father, help us to have a servant heart, to be humble and be willing to share with those that are less fortunate. Again, Father, we thank you for our elders and our deacons that have the oversight of these funds. And, Father, we pray for the good decisions they made in the past, and we pray that they'll continue to look to you for guidance as they look at programs that would bring glory and honor to you, that would grow this church and reach out in this community and show your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all sing out on this one.
song before the lesson will be 669, if you'll all stand for that and continue standing for the scripture reading. And then Mark will bring us our lesson. Scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. Then it happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging, and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, and he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood and still commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. You may be seated. Good morning. It is good to see everybody here today. And it's good to be this loud. I wish I had this at home. If you're visiting with us today, we're super glad that you're here. We have a lot of people gone for Labor Day who are out camping. And we have a lot of people who are traveling here and there and everywhere else. But we're excited and happy that you're here. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles. Luke 18, the passage which Kyle just read for us, is where our lesson will be from today. Luke chapter 18. As we get started, I wanted to talk for a second about uh, church and numbers and things such as that. We are just barely creeping on the door of 300. Last week, if you put the two services together, we had 296 And so that's an excellent number, especially under the present circumstances. So it says a lot that we have so many people who are here. It says a lot that it's such a good opportunity for us to be here. And uh, fellowship is a wonderful thing. We can't really shake hands. We can't hug. But it still feels good to be among God's people. As we go through in our lesson today, we see here in Luke 18, we're passing through the heart of of the book of Luke. Each gospel is pointing to a different direction. Uh, The book of Matthew revolves around five sermons as you run through it. And at the end of every sermon, what you see is Jesus speaks with the authority of God and not as a scribe or a Pharisee, not the authority of man. And so what Matthew is doing in his gospel 
is he's showing that Jesus is the great Messiah, and he's showing the power of Jesus in that way. And that's why there's so much Old Testament found in the book of Matthew. The book of Mark, the most common word in Mark is kai, which is and, is how you would translate it for us. And you see that Jesus is a man of action. He is always rolling, always going, and conquering everything that stands before him, whether it be the Roman government, whether it be the Jews, whether it be the demons and Satan. He's always moving. And so you see that, as the man says at the end of it, the centurion at the foot of the cross, truly this man is the Son of God. John's written about 60 years after the first three Gospels. And as you read through, well, excuse me, about 40 years after the first three Gospels, and you see a very uh, mental or philosophical view of Jesus. You see the seven signs that prove that he's the Son of God. You see the seven I am statements that prove that he's the Son of God. And the second half of the book, uh, from chapter 14 to the end of it, is talk about his death, burial, and resurrection. And as you read there in chapter 20, 30, 31, you see that these things are written, that you may have life, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now, the book of Luke is different than the other three Gospels. Because when you take Luke and Acts together, it forms a third of the New Testament, more than a third. And Luke, as far as we know, is the only New Testament book, along with Acts, which he also authored, written by a Gentile. And so you see that Luke is someone who has been on the outside looking in, and you see that reflected. Luke talks about women more than any of the other Gospels. Luke talks about Gentiles who come up to Jesus to speak to him more than any of the other Gospels. And you've noticed as we've run through this book, Luke is really hammering outsiders meeting who Jesus is. That brings me to a quick aside very, very quickly. The last couple of weeks, we've been talking about riches and wealth and things such as that. We've talked about how difficult it is for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. We've talked about how Jesus has said that we need to give our things away and things such as that. When we go through that series of sermons, I want to remind us about God's view of money. And that's what the lesson will be tonight. So watch on Facebook or live stream and let's talk about God's view of money. Is it wrong to have a house? Is it wrong to have a car? Is it wrong to have wealth? We're going to see that tonight, so be sure to watch on that tonight as we go through. But as we look at Luke, what you see is Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem in this passage. And you see that Luke is bringing things to an apex, to a climax as we go through, because he's wanting us to see the purpose of Jesus. We've just had the small children come to Jesus, and the apostles said, no, you're not allowed. Luke, through Jesus, says, yes, they absolutely are. You see Zacchaeus in the very next chapter, the short man who wants to see Jesus, but he can't fight through the crowd. And of course, nobody likes him because he's a tax collector. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm coming to your house today. You see the rich young ruler who everybody thinks, man, this guy has wealth. This guy has everything. The apostles actually invite him to come to see Jesus. And you see that he's rejected. He goes away because he is sorrowful because he loved his wealth. Well, here we are seeing Jesus walk through the city of Jericho. And you can imagine the scene as we think about it today, what it's like for Jesus to be passing through the city. Maybe you've had an opportunity to meet somebody famous or be around somebody who's famous. Uh, if you've ever had an opportunity to attend a political rally, especially one with a president, you can very well relate to what's going on here. I've had an opportunity to see two different presidents. I, I saw a Clinton and I saw a George W. Bush. Well, I guess I saw George H. W. Bush. That's three presidents. I've had an opportunity at least to be in a crowd and lay my eyes upon a president. And it's a very interesting thing that goes on. You have um, the hell to the chief, the song that's uh, played as he walks in, and you see everybody stand up. You see all the security guards who are around there in their suits and their sunglasses, and they've got these earpieces, and you just know under those suits there's probably all sorts of guns that are there, and they're just ready to pounce on anybody who doesn't act the way they should. And you can just feel in the air what it's like. When somebody who's a president or a leader of a country is about to enter in. That's what Jericho was about. You see, the city of Jericho probably had cleaned their streets. There's probably dignitaries. The mayor or the leaders of the city, the elders of the city, are probably lining at the front so that they can meet Jesus. 
this Jericho at this time was very likely a, a smaller city. And so this is a big deal. Jesus is on his way in about a week or two. He's going to be presented in Jerusalem as a king as he rides in a donkey and those palm fronds are put on the uh, road and everybody says, Hosanna, you know, hail Jesus. And so Jesus is walking through town and this is a very dignified procession. Imagine how everybody is expected to act. And imagine what's going on as Jesus is walking through and everybody is there and they're wanting to be in the presence of Jesus. But then there's a noise in the back. Somebody makes a strange noise. Mark tells us his name is Bartimaeus. But he begins asking, you know, why, what's going on here? Why is everybody acting this way? You see, Bartimaeus is blind. And while he can't see what's going on, he can feel what's happening in the air. He can hear all the rustling and all the people talking, and he knows that there's huge crowds. And so he's asking around, what's going on? Why is this happening? Who's coming? And somebody says, Jesus of Nazareth. And this blind man begins to cry out, son of David, have mercy upon me. And he begins crying out to Jesus. Now you can imagine how people feel about this. You remember the old days when somebody would cry in church and a mama would grab that baby by the uh, hand and walk out? I've seen it several times, especially in the beginning of my preaching career. Uh, One time this lady grabbed her little child and she was walking out and the lady was, or the baby was walking behind the mama saying, somebody save me. (laughs) You don't hear that very often in church, right? Save me, save me. The sermon is about baptism. is almost the perfect illustration. Well, you can imagine what people are feeling about this, this guy who's speaking up. Why was he blind? Many commentators, as they begin going through and looking at it, talk about how in the first century it was common for different parasites to cause blindness. And it's very possible that this boy had been somewhat neglected when he was a baby, Uh, Some insects sometimes would lay a larva within the eye. And thankfully, we don't have that on PowerPoint. Didn't look up that picture. But when that would happen, it would cause the uh, pupils to become opaque. And so you can imagine if somebody had that happen to your eyes, uh, how uncomfortable it would be to talk to somebody with that disability. And as that person would age, his eyes would become infected. And you can imagine just how uncomfortable it would be to be around that kind of person. You know, when the king is walking through town, when a dignitary is coming through, when you're trying to look good to everybody, that's the kind of person that you say, stay over here. We'll give you some extra alms if you'll just be quiet. Don't bother anybody. Just be quiet. Let this pass so that we can all look good. But that's not how Bartimaeus was going to do it. He began to cry out. And that first word there in the Greek is talking about just yelling at the top of his lungs. The second time you read about that word cry out, the word is literally in Greek, krazo, from which we get the word crazy. He is acting crazy as he is trying to get the attention of Jesus. And he is trying to get Jesus to know who he is and to do something about it. Imagine how embarrassed everybody would be about this. But there's something about Bartimaeus, this blind man that stands out. He begins crying out, Jesus, son of David. You know, that is the title of the Messiah. And it occurs in the book of Luke only three times. One time in Luke 3, 1 and 3, when you're talking about Jesus and his Messiahship. It occurs a little bit later as Jesus is entering into the city of Jerusalem and he's recognized as the king of Israel. Well, here is a person who society sees as a nobody, who everybody wishes was quiet, but he's the one that's saying the right thing and he's being crazy about it. Imagine that scene and imagine how uncomfortable everybody is right now. But Jesus stops. Jesus stops, looks at the man, walks over to him. And he asks a question which seems unusual to me. Jesus says, 
What is it that you want? Why would you ask that kind of question? What is it that you want? Well, you know, it's obvious, Jesus, this man is blind. He needs his eyesight. He's acting crazy. Why would you ask that kind of question? Jesus did something similar over in the book of John at the Pool of Siloam. Jesus walked up to a man who had been lame for many, many years as he was laying there. And Jesus said, you know, why aren't you healed? And he said, nobody's here to help me. I'm all alone. All this has happened to me. Woe is me. And Jesus asked, do you want to be healed? The man said, yes. Blind Bartimaeus in this passage says, yes, I want to be able to see. And so Jesus heals him. You ever wonder... Spiritually speaking, why we're here today. If Jesus were to appear among our midst, like he did to the apostles that very first Sunday service, what would, he, what would we answer? If Jesus were to appear and say, what do you want? What would be your answer? Wealth, money, freedom from problems. What is it that you seek? There's sometimes where we come to church and we've been here every Sunday. It's kind of a habit. It's just what good people are supposed to do. There are some times that we're here, maybe mainly because our parents are here, or maybe because our friends are here. There's sometimes we're here because it's what we've always done and it's what we think we ought to do. What is it that you seek? Blind Bartimaeus knew the answer, and he told him, I want to see. And so Jesus heals him, and he says this, your faith has made you well. Now let's talk about that for a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. When he says your faith has made you well, there are some religious groups who teach that man does not contribute one whit to their salvation. That God has already determined whether you're going to be saved or whether you're going to be lost from the very beginning of time. Some religious groups teach what's called uh, inherited depravity. In other words, you were born a sinner until the Holy Spirit stir stirs your heart. Until God somehow enters into you, you will never even have a desire for God. And you'll never even have a desire to turn to him. And therefore, since the Spirit is what saves, man does not play a part in his salvation. That's not what the Bible teaches. Yes, God has done the work. Yes, God has sent his son. Yes, our sins are placed upon the cross by his atoning death. But we are called to come to God. Peter himself would say, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And Ananias would say, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. We see that we must put to death the ways of the world so that we can live eternally for God. We need to respond to God in faith. Well, you see where this lesson is going. Because as we look at it, let's bring it to today. Here we are in Benton, Kentucky. As you and I see blind Bartimaeus traveling along, what would be our response? Well, we're in church. In church, you're supposed to look good, right? Now, many of us are wearing masks. Hopefully, you brush your teeth this morning, even though you're wearing a mask. Hopefully, for those of us who are not follically challenged, you combed your hair. Even though we stay six feet apart, hopefully, you showered. Why? Well, for health reasons, but even more so, you want to fit in and you want to look good. And we at church oftentimes want to look presentable. We want to look right. We want to look good. That's the reason why parents focus on their children many times in church. They want their kids to look good. We all want to be where we're supposed to be. And as a church, in many aspects, that's good. It's good for us to encourage one another, stir one another up. But what happens when we truly need Jesus? What happens when we have a need like blind Bartimaeus, when we have someone who sees a need that they have for Jesus, and they begin to speak up? 
Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it doesn't feel very good to recognize that our neighbor hurts, that our neighbor struggles. Sometimes it's hard for ourselves to admit that we're not as good as we want to be, that we really, in a lot of ways, don't measure up to what we assume everybody else is. How do we treat a brother who's speaking up and who is needing Jesus? How willing are we to admit that we need Jesus and to admit that we need to do those things that are right? You see, there's some of us who struggle. Maybe you struggle because of sin in your life. You want to be good. You want to be right. You want to live like Jesus. There's a lot of temptation. There's a lot of peer pressure. There's a lot of habits. And that worldly self, that devil self, comes through. And it makes it so hard. What do we do when somebody struggles with sin? What do we do when people are struggling with grief and sorrow? When they don't just, as our society says, get over it. Instead, they're struggling. They're trying to look right on the outside, but inside their heart is screaming a cry. How do we deal with those people? How do we deal with those who are dealing with confusion? Who know that they need to believe in God? Oh, it's hard. Who want to do what's right, but sometimes you're wondering whether or not what you're doing is right or whether what you're doing is not right. As a church, we need to welcome these people. We need to help these people. As a church, we need to take care of these people. But so often what happens in church is these people are afraid to let anyone know what it is they're going through. These people were afraid because while Jesus may be in our midst, we feel like we need to be dignified and honor him as a king. And so when someone cries out, save me, we're uncomfortable because it's not how we think people ought to be. Jesus is there to heal our pain. You see, We read in our Bibles that Jesus is a great physician. In Luke 5, 31, those who are well, he says, have no need of a physician. But it's those who are sick that need a doctor. And so if you need Jesus, that means you're sick. And if your neighbor is hurting, that means they need Jesus. In Luke 19, 10, our very next chapter we're going to be looking at, Jesus gives his mission statement. I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. But I want us to notice something about this passage. Our conversion is rarely a simple conversion. Our giving ourselves to God is rarely a socially acceptable sort of thing to do. You see, blind Bartimaeus, in order to get to Jesus, had to be crazy. He had to be crazy. He had to be obnoxious. And sometimes for you and I to reach Jesus, sometimes for you and I to get where we need to be, we've got to be crazy in the eyes of the world. We like to think that Christianity is a very rational, simple thing. But if you allow the world to control you, if you allow all the people who are around, and if you're trying to live up to all the people who are around you, it's going to be hard to ever be what God wants you to be. When you give yourself to the Lord... 
you're going to have to be willing to make other people uncomfortable. When you try to be faithful to God, whether it be at school or whether it be at work, there are some times you're going to have to stand up for what's right. And some people may think, ah, oh, that's a little awkward. It's kind of awkward that you're doing that. When you want to follow God, in many ways, as John 17 says, you're going to turn the world upside down. You're not going to fit society. You're not going to fit what everybody wants you to do because you are putting God first. Now, four years ago, four and a half years ago, I had a sermon illustration. And in the sermon illustration, I, I wanted to tell you it was four and a half years ago. We don't always remember what happened last week as far as the sermon goes, do we? So you may not remember this at all. I bet some of you will remember Here's what I did. I was kind of talking the same sermon, different passage, same sermon. Preachers do that. And what I did was I laid a $20 bill here on the table. And what I said was, this $20 bill is available to anybody willing to come up here. Now, that was supposed to create a very awkward situation because usually in church, everybody looks at each other and they're like, oh, I don't, you know. Can I really get up? Is this kind of weird? You know, it, you know, is there like a baptismal thing here where he's going to baptize me on my way up here? You know, we kind of feel weird. So that was what I was shooting for with the sermon. So I put it there, and Sam was sitting right there, and Sam stepped out, picked it up, and went back. <laughs> he acted too quickly, so it really messed my sermon up. It got us out early, though. And so let's go to our next slide. Pretend that I just did that and Sam didn't come up and get the money. If somebody gave you a gift today like that, would you be willing to accept it? Somebody said, hey, here's a $100 bill. All you got to do is get up in front of everybody and you can pick it up and it's yours. Would you do that? In front of everybody else? Is that something you would be willing to do? Let's talk about us for a few moments about what's going to go through most of our minds when this happens. There's going to be some people here who say, ah, you know, there's money over there. I don't need that. I've got all the money I need in the world. You know, I've got a great job. You know, there is no need to bother myself to come up here and get that. How many of us are that way spiritually? You hear about salvation. You hear about the blood of Jesus Christ. You hear about living a holy and acceptable life as a sacrifice unto God. But how many of us go through life and we say, you know, that's good up there, but I'm not going to go through that effort because we think, oh, I'm good enough or I'm sincere enough. You can reject money. But don't reject the blood of Christ. There's only one sacrifice which will get you into heaven. And there's only one judge you have to impress. And that is the Lord God. Other people would think to themselves, Oh, their money's up there. And man, I could use it. But if I get up there and grab it, everybody else is going to think that I need it. Everybody else is going to think, hey, you know, Mark, Mark obviously needed some money because he came up here. And then what will everybody think about me if I do that? People will laugh at me. People will think I'm crazy, although later they may try to take it from me. How many of us are that way spiritually? We know what we need to do, but we're not going to do it. In John 9, we read about a man who was born blind who was healed by Jesus. And it caused a great stir. Everybody was upset because this young man who had been healed said, Well, if Jesus, if Jesus healed me, he must be the Son of God. And the Pharisees were like, No, no, no. Nobody's allowed to say that. No, no, no. And they go to his parents. And what do his parents say? His parents say, Well, you know, he's grown up. Just talk to him. Why were they scared? to talk about their son and the fact that their son was healed. Most parents would be happy. 
The Bible tells us the reason that happened was because they were afraid of getting thrown out of the synagogue. They wanted to fit in more than they wanted salvation. And their care about their culture, their care about their society, and the comfort they felt in society was more important to them than their son meeting the Messiah. Three chapters later, we see where many people began to believe in Jesus who worked in the temple, but they were not willing to turn to God because they didn't want to lose their place. They wanted to keep their job. They wanted to keep honor above other people, and so they weren't willing to mention their need. How many of us are like that today? We know we need to clean up our language, maybe. But it's hard to do because what will our friends think about us when they've heard us talk that way before? We know we need to be baptized, but it's kind of embarrassing to do that sort of thing because what will everybody else think? It's hard getting in front of a large number of people. We need to change our lives and we need the prayers of our brothers and sisters in Christ. But sometimes we're afraid to admit that need is there. Sometimes people wouldn't get up and get that money because they think it's a trick. They think, oh, the preacher's going to do something. Or, oh, here I am. I'm going to be a sermon illustration. Some people won't come to God because they don't believe that salvation can be that simple. They don't believe that salvation can apply to them. Some people wait until it's too late because somebody's already jumped up to get it. And we read in our Bibles where Peter warns of that. In his sermon in Acts 2, he says, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. The promise is for you, your children, and for all those who are far off, as many as our Lord God will call. In Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, the preacher Ananias came up to Saul of Tarsus and he said this, Why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. As we sit here today, sometimes people will take Matthew 18 a touch out of context. That passage which says, you know, where Jesus is in the presence of two or more, that's actually talking about the judgment of the church upon other people as far as fellowship issues. But I think the principle is there. When God's people gather, God is there himself with them. As we're here today in the presence of Jesus, we're dignified. Many of us dress up for church. Many of us act a certain way because we want to show respect that Jesus is here. But are there any of us who need the Lord enough to be crazy? Are there any of us who need to step out of our comfort zone and make things right? Are there any of us who are willing to accept the eternal gift of the Savior? This morning, the question is, will you cry out to Jesus? Will you give yourself completely to him? This morning, if the invitation applies to you, if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
Sí. What a great Lord's Day that it's been. We all relate to certain invitation songs, but that is one of my favorites. Corey, great job. I appreciate leading that. Stirs the emotion a little bit. What a great lesson that we've heard this morning. We wish that we could have even greater fellowship, but the fellowship that we're having is certainly a blessing in itself compared to a few months ago. After I make these comments on some brethren, we'll have our prayer and then a few more announcements. Our sympathy is expressed to the family of Mason Thompson, the cousin of Noreen Jones, passed away this past week. Most of you know Mason. He's a member of the Hardin Church of Christ, led singing and a deacon over there for 70 years. Our sympathy is also expressed to the family of Nikki Kenzie, who passed away this this week. Both of these services, I believe, were held yesterday. Let us continue to remember those families in our daily prayers. Rick Knapper was here this morning, but Rick suffered an injury playing golf and has been quite uncomfortable. He was out of state and had to wait several days before he could uh, get back to Kentucky here. He will see a doctor tomorrow. It's back issues. So remember Rick. Ada Ray, who was having rehab at Mercy Health, is now back home and rejoices in that. She appreciates all the contacts that she's had, and we're glad that she is back in Benton. Gary Stagall also had outpatient sur surgery on Friday and is home and doing well. Remember Gary. Jacob Woods, this is the friend of John Ben Brown that was diagnosed earlier with a brain tumor, it's good news that that come back to not be malignant, so there's no cancer there. We rejoice with that family. Steve Brodsky, who some of you know, is a close friend of Bob York, is in critical condition with COVID-19. Nathan Pirtle will have a port removed on Tuesday, remember Nathan. Kenna Jones will have a stress test on Tuesday and other tests following and let's also remember Lonnie Woodruff, Jerry Johnson, Larry Farmer, and all of those that are on our sheet in the foyer. Would you bow with me at this time? Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful that we can petition you and come to, before you knowing that you hear our prayers. And we pray for all of these that have been mentioned. Be with the families that are grieving the loss of loved ones. Father, we pray that you would be with those that are going to go to the hospital or to have treatments this week, that you would make them more comfortable, and we pray for success in those situations. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for those that are out of the hospital, that are recovering. Father, we're still mindful of our young people and all of our students and teachers, and we pray a special blessing on them as they continue to move through a difficult time, at least situations that are different for them. We not only pray for them physically, we pray for them emotionally, as we do with all of our members. Let our emotions, Father, be contained, and let us look into you as Almighty God, knowing that you know where we need our prayers to be answered. Continue to be with this congregation as we seek to serve others and uplift others. We pray, Father, that you would bless us in a special way of all those things we may not even know how to ask for. Continue to be with us, and this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Don Frick is with us this morning over here. I've asked Don if he would to be in the foyer uh, during dismissal. Don and uh, a few others tomorrow will be going down to Lake Charles, Louisiana for some dis disaster relief uh, items to be delivered. And uh, if you would like to donate to that, if you have a check, you can make it out to the Bread of Life or Don can take cash also. And Don is a tremendous servant in that ministry. God bless Don for his commitment in that. If you'd like to help, he will be in the foyer. Jerry Waltrip wishes to thank all of her church family for all the contacts and acts of 
kindness during her recent sickness. It is very much appreciated, and she wanted everyone to know that. And God bless Jerry. The youth group, let's remember that there is no Devo this Sunday night, but next Sunday night, uh, September 13th, Nathan would like to meet with all of the parents, no matter what your situation is. If you have youth that are attending the youth group events, it uh, be a great time for you to get to know Nathan. He'll have some information to give all of the families, and uh, we, we hope that uh, some things are, will be able to resume, but he'll be talking to you about those things. That's next Sunday night, September 13th, here in the auditorium at 7. Remember this Wednesday, special Wednesday, because John Dale's going to be here speaking with us on Wednesday night. Remember that assembly is at 6.30, Facebook live stream, and of course in person and on the radio. And remember also that we have Bible classes, kindergarten through high school now on Wednesdays. We'll continue to look at that and adjust it if, if needed. Uh, right now we have the middle school or the third, fourth, and fifth grade, excuse me, and the middle school and high school going to class as they enter the building. And we have the younger ones waiting until sermon time to cut down on the little bit of the time that they have in the classroom. And I know the teachers probably appreciate that. If we need to make other adjustments, I know that you would be in contact with us and we'll be looking in regard to that. New Pathways is having an annual golf scramble on September 24th. Four persons on a team, if you'd like to participate, uh, there is a, there's flyers in the foyer, or if you would like to contribute to that, that can be noted uh, on that flyer. The office will be closed tomorrow on Labor Day and then reopened on Tuesday. We would just like for the family here at Benton to know that we're so thankful for what we've been able to do through you, through your commitment, through serving one another, helping one another, contacting one another. It is, has been a different time, and it'll be neat to look back in a few years and talk about this period of time that we're undergoing. I believe that God blesses the church during all times of its existence. And I sometimes think that periods of growth occur more during difficult times than perhaps even in good times. And may we look and approach our ministry that way. If there's anything that any member of this church needs, please contact Mark or Nathan or one of the elders or deacons. There are people here that will assist you and will help you. May our spiritual strength be edified and may it grow during this period of time. It's been a blessing to be here this morning. I hope that you have edif been edified through what we've been able to do at our worship here at Benton. I'm going to go ahead at this time, and Don, you can go ahead and walk out. The, the balcony can be, begin to dismiss, and Corey will lead us in a song, and the ushers will dismiss from the rear. Thank you for being here this morning. <clears throat> How sweet, how happy. 